of O King Eternal. All right, let's stand, shall we? We're going to have an opening word of prayer. Father God, we thank you that we can be here today during this Thanksgiving season of the year. And Father, we do indeed have thankful hearts for all that you have blessed us with. Father, we live in a land that is full of plenty. But Father, above and beyond that, we as believers thank you for Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for what Jesus did on the cross for us. Father, we pray that he would be glorified, that he would be lifted up in our presence today. And then, Father, this is a very special day for our church. It's the day that we ship out our Operation Christmas Child boxes. Father, we thank you. We pray that at the end of our service when we do this, it will be a joyous event as we minister to children around the world and share the gospel with them. So we pray that this will be a great time this morning. May you be glorified in all that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. Good morning, everyone. The call to worship this morning is taken from 558 in the hymnal on the screen also for us. And then our song service will be numbers 559 through 561. And the verses with the arrows on it. Let's begin. God saw all that he had made. And it was very good. You care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. For so you have ordained it. You crown the year with your bounty, and your carts overflow with abundance. The grasslands of the desert overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. The meadows are covered with flocks, and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for you and sing. He makes grass grow for the cattle, and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. How many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of every creatures. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, and his wonderful deeds for men. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. But I, with the song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Amen.
are single, maybe single by choice, maybe single because they got their children taken away or in the process of having their rights severed with their children, women that are coming out of prison and out of jail and early addiction recovery. We're meeting the need, if not, these folks would either be homeless or they would be couch surfing from home to home to home until they then became homeless. Just a light bulb went off in my head about how great would it be for us to have children of the Changing Life Center make crafts and gifts to put in boxes for Operation Christmas Child. It was amazing that the link up of how do we get our girls to have a project where they think of somebody or something bigger than they are. They get excited every week. They know it's Tuesday night. They're going to be doing crafts. They're going to be getting together in a social group. So it gave our single population, which is our largest population, more of a community sense of coming together and doing something for some other group as a group. For our packing party, we have lots of sponsors. We have churches that donate crafts. We have businesses that donate funds to help ship all of these boxes around the world. We know that every box here is meant for a specific child, and we just ask your blessing now on that child, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. This is the time of joy for them when we meet together. Uh, we are we just encourage them in what they're doing here at Changing Lives, and we have that kind of fellowship with them. We talk about the other side of the shoebox. It's so meaningful for them to give of themselves for the children. The first time I packed the shoebox, I was trying to place myself as that kid. How would my reaction be when I would open the shoebox? That gives me the chance to be a kid right there. I just think that it's just so amazing how God uses a tiny shoebox to change a little child's life. These women that are part of the center have been through so much. So to watch them come in here and give of themselves and how much heart and soul they put into this project. And it's amazing to watch. I can't wait to see where the rest of this journey takes us. Just learning about how much God loves me. Uh, really has changed the, the way that I see myself. My future is happiness, love, and just moving forward, not stepping back no more. There's no more back button, it's just a forward button. <laughs> There's no reason that we won't do this next year. Our girls set a goal of 200 boxes and they did 400. And they probably could have done twice that much. And next year we will. Join with me this morning as we pray for this program. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that we have the opportunity to uh, give to the program. We're so thankful that we have people over there that will receive these and pass it on to the children. We know that there are many children throughout the world that do not have the pleasures that we have here. And we're thankful that we can take part in this program. Be with those that receive it, that they also receive a message about you. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you that uh, this morning we can be here to worship you and also, Father, as we um, give to the cause of the gospel, bless each one of us as we give joyfully and we pray that you in our hearts. We do pray for the missionaries around the world, that uh, you bless them as they uh, bring the message of, of hope uh, to the lost. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen.
Mary, don't go away. We still need you. Uh, we're going to sing together, I love you, Lord, and then Joe's going to come and lead us in our prayer and share time together.
And I also want to thank each one of you who prayed for me on my back and my hip and leg. I went to the doctor last Friday, and first you thought it was my back, because two and a half years ago they x-rayed it. It's quite a bit of arthritis back there. But after examining me further, he thinks it's my hip. So Monday I should know more about that. But thanks again. I just appreciate all of you and um, love each one of you as a wonderful family here. And uh, again, I thank all those that came out yesterday. You look like a guy I used to know. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> uh, our names again are Kurt, uh, Becky and Christopher. Uh, way back in April, uh, Pastor Steve referred us on to... We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. <laughs> ...in Waitsburg that was going through a transition with their pastor. And so we just filled in there for quite some time as they went through a time of uh, transition and uh, yeah, interim time. And we've completed our time there. And then we had some family obligations, but I think we are settled then in back into our normal routine and looking forward to spending the Christmas season right here. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, we do uh, continue to pray for uh, Vern and Alan and uh, be with them at this time and meet their needs according to your will. And also, Father, we do pray for Nancy for her problem with the back and we just pray that uh, she'll get some relief and healing. And also, Father, we uh, do continue to pray for Betty for her hip that you will be able to get also some relief from that uh, hip pain. And Father, we also uh, pray for any unspoken requests this morning. And also, Father, touch your hearts as we listen to your word. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, please open to John chapter 19. Uh, we've been in the Gospel of John so long that uh, we were in John when you were here last. <laughs> we're still in John. And uh, it, it is still Passion Week. Uh, in fact, it, uh, it, is, it is now gone from Thursday night to Friday morning. And last week when we met, we'd seen that Jesus was arrested after he'd been betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was taken to a mock Jewish trial and then passed on to a Roman trial. And last week, we took a look at Pilate Part 1. Uh, and as we ended last week, uh, and, and Pilate is trying to figure this whole thing out, Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world, but that his followers followed him and worshipped him in truth. And Pilate asked that proverbial question, what is truth? We said that the only truth that Pilate knew, the only truth that Pilate respected, was that of power, power and prestige. And now Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, is standing before this puny little earthly ruler, and yet he submits himself to him because in the Garden of Gethsemane, as he prayed, he said to the Father, Not my will, but thine be done. Well, today we're going to pick up on the second part of the trial before Pilate. Our key verse this morning will be in John chapter 19, verse 15, where it says this. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Now, the point that we want to make as we get into this story this morning is this. The same crowd who cried Hosanna on Sunday cried crucify him on Friday. And so when I read a story like this, you know, we, we just can't let this pass by. It, it's more than just a good story. It is the truth, and it applies to our lives today. And so I need to ask myself, what if, or so what? And so the question that I need to ask myself is this. 
who is my king? Jesus or Caesar? Now you might say, well, wait a minute, there's no Caesar today. The Roman Empire, you know, fell apart hundreds and thousands of years ago. But Caesar represented the world. The power of the world. Are we following Jesus or are we following the world? That's what we need to decide. And so two things this morning as we go through the story together. First of all, Jesus flogged by Pilate. And secondly, Jesus presented by Pilate. Now remember, this is in Jerusalem. You have the Temple Mount, and right next to the Temple Mount was the Praetorium. It was an edifice designed by the Romans to look over the Jews, to keep them in line. And of course, Pilate was in Jerusalem for only one reason. It was the Passover. They were worried about riots. They were worried about a revolution. And Pilate was there to keep the peace at any price. And so first of all, Jesus flogged by Pilate. We saw last week that Pilate was not impressed at all by the Jewish leaders. He didn't want to try Jesus. He said, you do it yourself. And so now, after wrangling with them, he comes up with an idea. And the idea is this. If I can flog Jesus, if I can punish him most severely, maybe they will just drop this idea of crucifixion altogether. And so in chapter 19, verse 1, it says this. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now, in our society, we have no idea what that means. And so we've got to go back and talk about it just a little bit. The brutal act of scourging or flogging had three purposes. First, it was used to beat the prisoner as a form of punishment. Second, it was used to extract a confession from the prisoner. And finally, in cases of crucifixion, it was used to weaken the victim so he would die more quickly on the cross. Scourging was a legal preliminary to every Roman execution. And only women and Roman senators or soldiers, except in the cases of desertion, were exempt. It was absolutely brutal. Any prisoner who was being flogged would gladly confess and beg for this to end. Why? Because as the Roman soldiers repeatedly struck the victim's back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep confusions, and the leather thongs and sheep bones would cut into the skin and subcutaneous tissues. Then, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. You know, there was the old 39 lashes. The reason why was they believed that if a prisoner was flogged 40 times, he would die as a result of the flogging. Pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. The extent of blood loss may well have determined how long the victim would survive on the cross. The severe scourging with its intense pain and appreciable blood loss most probably left Jesus in a pre-shock state. Moreover, hematidrosis had rendered his skin particularly tender. The physical and mental abuse meted out by the Jews and the Romans, as well as the lack of food, water, and sleep, also contributed to his generally weakened state. So according to Edwards, therefore, even before the actual crucifixion, Jesus' physical condition was at least serious and possibly critical. This was Pilate's solution. Take him out and flog him. Beat him almost to the point of death. Bring him back so that he is almost unrecognizable. And then, 
present him again to the Jewish people. Verse 2 says, The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Today, if you go to Jerusalem, you can actually visit the place where all of this took place. And down below the current structure in the basement are the actual paving stones where the Roman legions carried out this brutal torture. And what is interesting is they have an area roped off that you can look at, and into these stones is etched something called the King's Game. Apparently the Roman legions had some sort of a game that they played with dice or some other instruments. But now they had Jesus, and he claimed to be a king. And so they were playing the king's game brutally by beating Jesus and humiliating him even further. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing a cr the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Today in Jerusalem on the Via Dolorosa, on the buildings that are built over that site, there is an arch. And it is referred to as the Ecce Homo Arch. Because in Latin that means, Here is the man. So Pilate thought that he had done the politically correct thing. An innocent man, but beat him and flogged him to the point of almost death, and maybe this would satisfy the Jews. So Jesus is flogged by Pilate. But now as Jesus is presented by Pilate, we see the Jews reveal their true colors. Verse 6. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. So the Jewish leaders want Jesus dead. They hate him. He stands opposed to their religious system. He has broken their rules. He is a threat to their authority. They have plotted with Judas to betray him. Now they want Jesus dead. And not just by stoning, but by crucifixion. The most horrible form of punishment and death ever invented. This according to fulfill the prophecies of Scripture. And so Pilate says, you take him. You crucify him. For the third time, Pilate pronounces Jesus innocent of all charges. Verse 7, it says this. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. The pretense is over. No longer are they trying to accuse Jesus on being king of the Jews. Their real objection is that he claims to be God. Two things here. They won't hunt him dead based on Roman law. Their accusations about him being the king of the Jews just was trying to get the Roman government to say, well, you know, we can't have a Jewish king. We can only have a Roman king, Caesar. That didn't work. And so they now reveal their true colors. And that is that Jesus has broken the Jewish law, the law of blasphemy. Now, remember earlier in our study of the Gospel of John, I, I mentioned to you that sometimes you'll be talking to somebody and they'll say, well, you know, you Christians have it all wrong. Jesus was a good man. Jesus was a good teacher. Uh, he was a great moral leader, but he never claimed to be God. And remember back then what I told you you should say? You should say, oh really? 
Well, here is one of those scriptures that you can point them to. If Jesus never claimed to be God, why did the Jewish leaders want him dead? Because he had broken the law by claiming to be God. Verse 8. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power? Either to free you or to crucify you. Remember last week we talked about the fact that that was the one thing that Pilate was impressed with. Was power. And here he is exercising his power. Verse 11. Jesus answered. You would have no power over me, if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Pilate still didn't understand the true nature of power. He believed that he had real power, but Jesus makes it plain. You could have no power at all against me unless I have, it has been given to you from above. Again, remember, there's that old hymn that we often sing regarding the crucifixion. He could have called 10,000 angels to set him free. At any point, Jesus could say, I'm tired of this. It's over. Lightning bolts could have come from heaven and struck Pilate dead on the spot. But remember, in the garden, Jesus prayed, not my will but thine be done. He was going to the cross, and he knew it, and so he stood there as the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, and let Pilate have power over him. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. The Jews wanted him dead, and now they were putting political pressure on Pilate. If word got back to Rome that Pilate was allowing a Jew to be king over Judea in Pilate's place, Pilate would have lost his job and maybe his head. And so in verse 13, it says, when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat him down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. By this time, Jesus should already be exhausted. They had the day before. They, they, they spent the evening celebrating the Passover meal. He went to the garden. He's arrested during the middle of the night. He's beaten by the Jews. He's now flogged by the Romans. And it's already noon. He's had no water. He's had no food. And he's under extreme emotional pressure. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. Jesus beaten, bleeding, emaciated with a mock crown of thorns, a mock purple robe. Verse 15 but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Jesus stood before them as their Messiah, the Messiah who had been, who had been promised for hundreds of years. The Messiah who came as their suffering servant, who in the future would come as the King of kings and Lord of lords, and they reject him completely. Instead of accepting God's Son, they say, we will follow Caesar. Caesar represented the world of that day. There was no one more powerful in the world system than Caesar. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them, to be 
crucified. Now, if you want to find out what happens next, you need to be here in January. <laughs> Why January? Because next week begins Advent. And as we go through our Advent celebration together, each of the candles represents something of the Nativity story. And we're going to be talking about each one of those events. But in January, we will pick up the story. I want to read to you a quote by a man by the name of Erdman that is more than a quote, it's an indictment. He says, You may do today exactly what Pilate did. He is simply an example of a man who lacks decision of character, who does not possess the courage of his convictions, who tries to compromise with wrong, who disobeys conscience through fear of personal loss. What a stinging indictment. So we've talked about Jesus flogged by Pilate and Jesus presented by Pilate. I want to leave that screen picture on the screen. We have another picture to show you in a few minutes. But I want to tell you a story. The story begins with Mark and Debbie Sutherland. They were gracious enough to loan us a video that we showed a couple Sunday nights ago uh, on Sunday evening. The film is entitled God Isn't Dead. Now, I don't know if you've seen this or not. I don't want to spoil it for you, but I only want to tell you part of the story. In this story, there is a young college freshman. His name is Josh Wheaton. And he, on the first day of class, goes to a philosophy class. And in order for him to go on, he has to not only pass all of his courses, but he needs to do well in them. He has a goal for himself. He wants to become a, a lawyer. And so he walks into this big classroom that's like an amphitheater, and the professor, whose name is Professor Radisson, begins the first day of class by passing out a piece of paper. And he says, I, I want to get something out of the way in the very beginning. I want to put to end the notion that there is any such thing as God. And so, in order to start this class uh, right, I want you to take this piece of paper, and I want you to write on this piece of paper, God is dead. And then I want you to sign your name. In a couple of minutes, I'm going to come, and I'm going to collect all the papers. And once all of you have signed this, God is dead, then we can move on with this class, and we can talk about the philosophical things that are really important. Well, this young freshman, Josh, is a Christian. And he sits there and he looks around, and every student in that theater writes on their piece of paper, God is dead, signs their name, passes it in, but he's sitting there with a blank piece of paper. Finally, when the, the professor comes to collect it, he crumples it up and hands it to him. And the professor said, you didn't sign, God is dead. And the young freshman says, I can't. Because I believe God is alive. And the professor said, you don't understand. If you do not sign that piece of paper, you will fail this course. If you believe that God is alive, your only alternative is to stand up in front of this class and prove to me that God is alive. Well, Josh, the freshman, said, well, that's really not fair because you're not the only one in this room. What if I prove to all of these students that God is alive? The professor said, fine, here is your challenge. For the next three sessions, you will have 20 minutes each time to prove that God is alive. At the end of that time, we'll take a vote. And if that vote fails, you fail this class. Well, the young, professor, the young freshman left very disheartened. But he was a believer and he knew he needed to do something. Well, his girlfriend found out about this. And his girlfriend wanted him to be a success. She wanted him to ace all of his courses and become a lawyer. 
And she said, if you have anything to do with this, we're done. He said, I have to do this. I have to do this. His parents contacted him and said, don't be foolish. Sign the piece of paper. Pass the class. And so in the midst of all of this turmoil, where his professor says, sign the paper. His girlfriend said, sign the paper. His parents said, sign the paper. His friends say, sign the paper. He goes and talks to a pastor. Now, Mark, what did the pastor say? The pastor said, you're here because that still small voice inside you isn't happy with the choices everyone else wants you to make. All you have to do is decide whether or not you're willing to listen. It's not easy, but it's simple. He listened to the still small voice. Now, if you want to know what happens, you have to watch the movie. <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it for you. Everybody else wanted him to sign the paper and say, God is dead. Everyone else wanted him to deny his faith. You know, on Sunday morning of Passion Week, the crowds were all enthusiastic. They were putting palm branches on the road. They were laying their cloaks. They were happy to see Jesus. They, they were crying, Hosanna! But now everything had changed. What if you were in the crowd at noon on Friday? What if your leaders were shouting, crucify him, take him away? What would you say? Would you still be willing to stand up in that crowd and cry, Hosanna? Or would you join the crowd? The crowd said, crucify him. The crowd chose Caesar. The crowd chose the power of this world instead of Jesus. Remember what our key verse is this morning? John chapter 19, verse 15. But they shouted, take him away, take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked. Again, remember, they said, we have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered. The point we simply want to make is the same crowd who cried Hosanna on Sunday cried crucify him on Friday. So, what about me? What about you? Who's your king? Who's my king? We live in a day and age where even though that story about God isn't dead is a fictitious story, more and more students in school are having to make a choice. More and more people in the workplace are having to make a choice. More and more people with their friends and families are having to make a choice. Who is our king? Is it Jesus or the world? Jesus or Caesar? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this ongoing story from the Gospel of John. And Father, we thank you that Jesus was true to you, the Father, and he was willing to go to the cross for us. But Father, I think about those religious people in the crowd that day who chose Caesar instead of Jesus, who instead of crying Hosanna, cried crucify him. Father, help us to be faithful to you. Help us to choose Jesus, even in a day when Jesus is no longer politically correct. Help us to be the people you want us to be. For it's in Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen.
if you are willing and able to stay, what we're going to do is we're going to make a line. We're going to move the screen. We're going to move this stuff at the front. We're going to make a line that goes from the front of the uh, altar there where the boxes are, out the side door, down the ramp, and uh, uh, we have a trailer. And if the trailer gets full, then I think we have some other vehicles as well. But anyway, um, we would just like everybody to stand. So hopefully, all you have to do is just stand in one spot and pass it on to the person next to you. Hopefully, we won't have to have people running up and down uh, the ramp. Uh, so after we pray, give us just a moment to move the screen and move this. But I'm going to ask Ben Vegers if he would pray. And this is not a prayer of benediction. This is a prayer, a prayer of dedication. These boxes are going to go somewhere in the world. We don't know where. We don't know the names of the children who are going to receive these boxes. But for some of these children, it will be the first time that they've ever received a Christmas present in their life. And also, it will probably be the first time that they ever hear the gospel. Because the gospel will be presented with these boxes. And then, they will be invited to join a study course for, I think it's 12 weeks, where they learn about Jesus and they learn about the Bible. And at the end, they can graduate and receive a Bible. So, Ben, will you dedicate these boxes to the Lord and pray for the children who will receive them? Dear Father, we're thankful today for the opportunity of giving to those who are in need. So many don't have shoes to wear. So many can't afford it. But we pray to bless every person who has brought and has given to make these possible. And we pray today for those who help to move the shoes out and to pack them out. Bless them. We commit this all into your loving hands in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 